Hello and welcome to Popcorn Digest. Set your faces to fun as we're taking on Star Trek V. So very tired. <laughs> Had trouble sleeping last night. My hiatal hernia is acting up. The ship is drafty and damp. I complain, but nobody listens. A Star Trek film so dull, it'll leave you pining for Harry Mudd. That, sir, is an outrageous assumption. Yeah. When Mr. Spock's long-lost half-brother Psylocke hijacks the Enterprise to aid his search for the Almighty, it's left to Kirk, Bones and Mr. Spock to stop him and blow up God in this much maligned <laughs> sequel. But is the final frontier worth beaming aboard, or should we unload our photon torpedoes on this sucker? Captain Kirk, Bones, Spock. This is what I want from yeah. a Star Trek property. Yeah. And so it's a it's a shame that this film <laughs> does a disservice to all that, really. Fire the rockets! Although I would say that the, the strongest part of this film still is in its characters. I think that's always something that shines through is just the general chemistry between the actors. Yeah. They clearly love playing the roles. And they still have something to do with them. It's just everything around it, really. That's yeah, exactly. That's, uh, it, it lets them down. Yeah, it lets that, those relationships down as well. Yeah. But yeah, this was something that Shatner worked for two years on. He was really uh, invested in doing this. Yeah, you can't fault him for either ambition or motivation he was definitely motivated to make this film and he put everything he had into it really mm. the idea of making a star trek film around religion actually originates with him as well yeah yeah he was inspired by televangelists yes and um, that he'd been watching on tv which i have a quote from him that he describes them as repulsive strangely horrifying yet absolutely fascinating and the day will come you'll walk out of it in the name of jesus thank you lord thank you lord Thank you. Yeah. And that does translate through mm. the film as well. You do have this evangelist. You mean Space Jesus. Yeah, you have a, yeah, you have Space Jesus figure who's the bad guy of the film. Yeah. All the way through this production, I guess the studio had concerns about making it with that idea in mind. They were afraid of offending people. Yeah, I think his original premise was Star Trek go on the search to find God, but instead find the devil. Then here is the proof you see. <laughs> But this film is literally, it's a lot of scenes of people stood in rooms talking to each other. Yeah. There's not much in terms of elaborate set pieces. or I, I can only think of one set piece in particular, and that is the attack on Paradise. Yeah, Paradise City, yeah. Paradise City, yeah, or Paradise Lost City. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And that's the only one that I can really think of that required, like, a certain number of extras, which they apparently only had very few and just reused mm. them over and over again. Yeah, yeah. And even on the commentary, he repeatedly criticises himself for doing TV staging. Yeah. Basically saying, I had to do it that way because that was all the time that we had allotted to do those kind of shots. Yeah. So it looked, for me, it seems as if they had the money but they didn't have the time in order to implement that money effectively. It seems like a lot of things that they'd spent ended up being wasted because they didn't have the time to really do them justice. Yeah. As such, it felt like more the time was the issue rather than the money that was the issue in the end of the day. It looks like it's more of a, a lack of technical filmmaking know-how. Yes. Yeah, it's like, it's like an A for effort and C for execution. Ex- exactly, yeah. Because it's there seem to be a lot of things when he's talking about the making of the film where it's more like people have assured him that it'll work. Like the complete opposite of, say, someone yeah. like James Cameron where he's like knows their job better than anyone else and he'll like, no, this should work better because X and Y, Z. Yeah. And uh, William Shatner is really relying on people to do things for him. Like, for example, the, the fiberglass rock face. Yeah. He was assured would work. And then also, obviously, the infamous rock monster which they can only afford one off because I know that he wanted like 10 of them. Yeah, it originally started that he wanted angels and demons to be chasing him at the end and then they had to cut that out for budgetary mm. reasons and he said, okay, we well, can have 10 rock monsters and then that became five rock monsters then that became one rock monster yeah. and then that was cut mm. from the film. After How yeah. much did he spend on it? $350,000 on the rock monster. <laughs> which four minutes of test footage uh, remains. <laughs> This film needed a director who was going to chase that up yeah. and, and say, where the fuck is my rock monster, man? Yeah. <laughs> 
and why have you designed it this way? And yeah. it's like, because even if you look at the sketches versus what they came up with, it's nothing like the sketches no. at all. It's just that they went and did what they wanted to do. It doesn't look bad. It doesn't look like the sketches. And there definitely could have been a lot more control on that part of it. And it's like he has us left it to someone to do. But at the end of the day, it's like you get this. And obviously because of the time constraint and lack of experience and, and technical know-how, they've just gone, doesn't look good. Let's just lose it. Yeah. And they've, they've just wasted three hundred fifty, four hundred thousand dollars of a thirty-three million dollar budget, which is not small change. I kind of get the feeling like this thirty-three million dollar budget has been wasted somewhat. Mm-hmm. There's a real lack of finesse in those scenes, and there's a real lack of, and this is a problem for the whole film. Yeah, intensity. Yeah, it, it just kind of meanders along. Even the Klingon scenes, even when they're being chased, it's just kind of plodding along. Yeah, there is a real lack of uh, pacing and intensity. Like, mm-hmm. there's no faster and more intense going on here. No, no, uh, there isn't. <laughs> yeah, even when they're running around the ship and like uh, Scott is breaking them out, and there's that the famous scene when he walks into the panel. You can't mention Mr. Scott. You're amazing. The way that he's saying the line, it feels like he's just had a stroke or something. Yeah. Like he's exhausted. He looks exhausted. I actually have a I little bit like, of trivia about sit that Sit down, scene. James. <laughs> you look You're like, diabetes, sir. <laughs> yeah. It's like, that's the take that they got. <laughs> in fact, he had a real hard time with that scene in particular because there's a lot of pipes running across the floor mm. and in order to have the dolly move in the way that they wanted they had stage hands moving the pipes opening them up and then closing them before <laughs> they came into frame so that the camera could dolly past them yeah and that was really distracting for james Duhan. william shanter says apparently every single time they did a take he'll get halfway through and forget his lines because he was too busy looking at what everybody else was doing behind the camera mm. i mean it is a terrible take mm. and it's quite obviously so and again this is supposed to be our big prison break moment and it simply cuts to them walking along a corridor mm. not really rushing no intensity about it they're just terribly explaining what they need to do next this film doesn't really open with much of a bang not much happens in the opening although we like a few of the things that um, like a few of the shots maybe mm. the scenes could be moved elsewhere yeah yeah but when we do see that very long seven or eight minute long campfire scene, number one, it's too long. It goes on too long. Shatner indulges himself for too long. But I don't know. There's something really like comforting in seeing these characters together, just sharing stories around a campfire. Yeah, it's yeah. just is this really the kind of thing that we need to open our films with? It's maybe it's another place in the film. Maybe this is where we should end the film, like they do. Yeah. But yeah. the only thing I would say is that. Um, I found it really hard to see bones in this opening in the woodland. You might say that I couldn't see the forest for the trees. Oh. Hey. I'm here all week. Oh, God. <laughs> I've been building up to that oh. for so long. You've been planning that for weeks, yeah, haven't you? I've got it wrote in my notes. So, yeah. I'll knock you on your goddamn ass if you think it would help. Oh, oh, Mr. Sulu, get us out of here. I'll try, Captain. Alert, Klingon torpedoes activated. Alert. Evasive action. To make a very unfair comparison, I'm going to mention Wrath of Khan Mm. and how that film opens. We open with the infamous Kobayashi Maru test in which it's demonstrated that there is such thing as a no-win scenario. Yeah. And we see Kirk's response to that which is oh he's the person that cheated the kobayashi maru test Mm. and that film sets us up for what the entirety of the rest of that film is going to be about it's going to be about kirk facing the no win scenario and Mm. facing the scenario in which he has to sacrifice something where something is lost in order to gain something else and he's and it's also about age and death as well exactly yeah. yeah Death is something that we almost face. It is the final adventure that we almost face. Yeah. And, mm. and that sets up that film perfectly with a nice, solid action beat. This film starts off with a man we don't know on a horse talking to another man we don't know. And then our three main characters sat around a campfire, really. I mm. mean, there's a slight action rock climbing thing, mm. but... It's not interesting enough. We need an action beat to really set up what the rest of this film mm. is. I think they should have took all that dialogue from from the uh, campfire and whatever that scene means and try, try and translate it into a way that has a little bit of pizzazz, has a little bit of action to it. 
Because at the end of the day, all of the stuff in Yosemite is superfluous to the, the film. It's there just to reintroduce you to the characters, but it doesn't say anything about the journey that they're about to no. commence on. And it's far too flimsy and, and fluffy and comedic to just really justify itself on screen. Yeah. Especially at that particular point in the film, at least. I do think that these um, actors are given their all, but the one standout for me that I would say, and this is a scene in which the characters, the acting, and the script comes together to mm. deliver what would be probably the film's only impactful scene, I would say. Yeah, it's the best scene in the whole film. It, it really is. It's the scene in which Bones relives the death of his father and he's made to relive it it's this pain that he's been keeping inside him because one thing we haven't mentioned really much about the story is that this uh, cybot character his whole religion is built around releasing people's pain that doesn't actually go anywhere and that doesn't mean anything on a character level either each man hides a secret pain it must be exposed and reckoned with it must be dragged from the darkness and forced into the light Share your pain. Share your pain with me. And gain strength from the share. They set him up as he is a Vulcan who's very unvulcan like. And that is something that is commented on in the film, but we're never really given the reason as to why. Yeah. And he goes around absolving people of their pain, helping them overcome whatever inner personal turmoil they have. But yet we never do find out what is motivating mm. that from him. What is his inner turmoil, his personal pain mm. that he has overcome with the help of his God? Yeah. If we knew that, perhaps we would understand where the character is coming from and what informs him. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, again, it's just left as one of the many strands in the film. It's completely unexplored. It's one of those great shames, really, because I feel like this is where the core of the film is and if they'd tapped into it more and kept that level all the way through the film you could have ended up with something really strong and really weighty yeah it's a shame that this is the only sort of bit above the clouds really The whole film is leading up to this encounter and it's all done and dusted within, say, three or four minutes. I thought, gosh, we're going to see something now. We're really going to see something we haven't seen in Star Trek before. And it's the moment that they enter that great barrier in space Mm. and they're about to go through to the other side, to this planet's surface where this god apparently is. Anything could be on this, (laughs) on the other side of this barrier. It turns out it's just pretty much like Californian desert painted a slight purplish tinge in (laughs) in post-production and you've got this Terry Gilliam-esque floating head of god. Yeah. Now knock it off. Yes, Lord. It is so disappointing that that's what it adds up to and there is so much potential in the idea it's presented in the film i like the idea of cyborg being somebody who's being exploited through Mm. religion and it seems that at some point that all these things was going to be what the film was about Mm. and all of that was lost some point in the making but even like the fact that it's it's the film's title as well they get to the frontier and they they pass through it so easily yeah why isn't that difficult yeah like why isn't the the ship like almost destroyed even getting through it it'd just be the natural thing to do and and to have some sort of drama at that point but no there's no hard work done in this oh. film at all. And there are no stakes There's either. no stakes at all. Because why do we care if this field of energy is released from this planet or not? All that we know is it's posing as a god, and it's not. It has been a prisoner because it did something bad. We don't know what. What terrible thing is going to happen if it does get to the Starship Enterprise and escape? Are we ever told? No, it just wants the Starship. That's it. Yeah, and then we get that infamous line, which what is, does God what does God need a Starship? starship? Yeah. Excuse me, I just like to ask a question. What does God need with a starship? Which, I, 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 I like, like, that, I like line. that line. I like yeah. that line. It often gets a lot of um, ridicule, but I like that line. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, from that moment onwards, it just turns into... It reminds me of, like, a uh, Terry Gilliam cartoon because it's just, <laughs> like, a, a floating head of God that can shoot lasers out of yeah. its eyes. And he's got a dodgy beard as well. Yeah. <laughs> Like and, Father Christmas. And they overcome it so easily. They just blow it up. It's like, why couldn't they have had a sequence where it actually got onto the Enterprise and then he yeah. could jettison it in some... There's so much potential in this story. Mm-hmm. It really is. And But it's executed in the most lumpen way possible. And you should have had a whole chunk, a good chunk of the film, a good like half an hour, maybe even half the film of exploring mm. what happens beyond meeting this creature, this mm. god, 
exploring the ideas of where it could go what you know what destruction it could wreak if it did or what goodness it could bring if it could and yeah it's so anticlimactic i mean not that anything is particularly brilliant leading up to it anyway but yeah apart from that one uh bone sequence really but i've no idea how he defeats the god alien thing there. no <laughs> or when it's even established that he could enter the force field yeah uh, to feel his pain <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah all he does is it, i mean this is the film's like grand finale and it ends yeah. with cyborg simply walking through a force field and grappling with well it's pretty much himself yeah a vision of himself and then that's it that's how he overcomes god in some way mm. i don't get it no there's nothing clever in the way in which they overcome it it's not like um, they use its own thinking against them or anything like that like so many so many episodes <laughs> so many episodes of star trek and with captain kirk posing some kind of like moral question <laughs> yeah some either like moral dilemma or some paradox to some computer system or artificial intelligence and it simply blows up <laughs> contemplating it I would have taken that. Yeah. I would have taken that over what happens in this film. Because at the end of the day, it's like having that, but he gives him a hug instead and that blows up. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's the same thing. Yeah. It's like, I embrace you, boom. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the latest episode of the show. Remember to like, share and subscribe. And remember you can catch the full-length podcasts both on our YouTube page and on any podcast hosting platform such as Podbean, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, etc. See you soon.